Hello, welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams, your one watt golden voice of cable television. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're actually going to give you a brief update as to what's been happening on in the world of sexual harassment allegations. Uh, keep in mind, this is a brief update. Two weeks ago, we ran a show about uh, U.S. Senator Al Franken and the allegations that were leveled against him. Since then, there have been like four or five others who have come out and made similar claims. We also mentioned that show two weeks ago that State Senator Dan Schoen and uh, State Representative Tony Cornish have been asked to resign, and they have. They have resigned their positions, and there will be special elections soon. Also, we have had more allegations against more people. Uh, Congressman Joe Barton from Texas, uh, Congressman John Conyers from uh, uh, Michigan, from the Detroit area. Uh, Conyers is 88 years old and the longest serving member of Congress in American history. Uh, he, first, as, uh, he first got elected in 1964. He's been there ever since. Uh, and then, of course, we've got the Franken allegations. And then add to it, you have uh, Matt Lauer from the uh, uh, Today Show on NBC. He's been asked to resign. And then uh, Charlie Rose. He's been relieved of his duties on uh, television for uh, PBS. And now uh, Minnesota Public Radio has been distancing themselves from um, Garrison Keillor. So all is not well in Lake Wobegon. So that's kind of your update. I'm not going to get into the issues because everybody else is, and we covered it two weeks ago because it was breaking news at the time, but we're not going to do the, you know, any more on that topic for today because we have another full episode of really good material for you. So we're going to do our Prager University segment, uh, Everyone Should Stand for the National Anthem. We're not going to beat the National Anthem uh, horse dead because it's already been beaten. We've already covered this previously, but it kind of does lead into uh, some of the rest of the content that we have for today's show on uh, really on uh, Americanism. So here's our Prager University segment for today. The national anthem stands for freedom, even the freedom to do foolish things, like protesting the national anthem. But like my mom always said, just because you are free to do the wrong thing, it doesn't mean you should. Starting in 2016, some professional football players have refused to stand when the national anthem is played before a game. Some of them kneel, some of them sit on the bench, some of them raise their fist, and some don't even come out of the locker room. This was all started by San Francisco 49er quarterback Colin Kaepernick. His idea was to protest the alleged mistreatment of black people by police and by America in general. As he put it, I am not going to stand up to show pride in a flag for a country that oppresses black people and people of color. Kaepernick no longer plays in the league because apparently NFL owners are racist against backup quarterbacks who don't throw well. But his protest lives on and has spread to college and high school athletes. Even elementary school kids have gotten into the act. I like football and I sing the anthem publicly at events. This doesn't make me an expert, but I've got a problem with some things here. First, the protest is based on something that just isn't true. And second, even if it were true, the protest is misdirected and self-defeating. Let's start with problem one. Despite what we're told by Black Lives Matter and their media allies, the police are not engaged in a coordinated campaign to destroy the black race. As Harvard professor Roland Fryer, who happens to be black, and others have shown there is no evidence of racial bias in police shootings. In any case, the thing that makes headlines, police shootings of unarmed black men, is very rare. How rare? Statistics show that an unarmed black man is more likely to be killed by lightning than a policeman. So if police are trying to persecute black folks, they're doing a really bad job. 
Am I saying racism doesn't exist? Of course not. Am I saying racist cops don't exist? Of course not. But I would say this. Blacks have a lot more to fear from black criminals than from the police. The police keep us safe, and they risk their lives every day doing it. That sounds like it's a lot more deserving of a thank you than a screw you. Now, problem two. The protest is misdirected and self-defeating. The American flag and the national anthem are symbols that represent our country. Even if some police officers are racist jerks, it doesn't make sense to protest those particular jerks by demonstrating against the country as a whole. Martin Luther King Jr. protested discrimination against blacks on city buses by boycotting city buses. He never denigrated the flag or the anthem. In fact, he did the opposite. He argued that the people who oppress blacks are the ones denigrating the flag and what it stands for. And what does it stand for? Ironically, it's the protesters themselves who give us the answer. It stands for freedom. The fact that you can disrespect the anthem and the flag proves that you're free. Anyone who doesn't stand for the anthem would do themselves a favor if they studied some current events. They'd learn that oppressive countries don't allow anyone to publicly disrespect national symbols, much less earn millions of dollars while doing it. You won't see anyone sitting for their national anthem in North Korea or Iran. Well, you might, but that will be the last time you see them. Which brings me to my final point. In America, where you are free to sit or stand during the national anthem, sitting when you should be standing is more a statement about you than about America. And you don't come off too well. You come off, frankly, as ignorant and ungrateful. Ignorant about a country that works to correct its faults and ungrateful for the opportunity and freedom that it offers all its citizens. For that, I'm standing. How about you? I'm Joy Villa for Prager University. And that is today's Prager University segment. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that, and if, if you've been a long time viewer of this show, you probably have noticed that we cover a lot of history, that we show the sacrifices that have happened in the past in order to make America great. Today is no exception to that. 74 years ago, on November 20th, so 74 years in, what, uh, in a week or 10 days, the Marine Corps and the Army went in at the Tarawa Atoll on Basho Island, or at least Basho for the Marines. Uh, the um, Macon Island was taken by the 27th uh, Infantry Division of the U.S. Army. And it was the bloodiest battle that we had that the we had faced in World War II up until that point. So November twentieth to twenty third, nineteen forty three, and we're going to show you some um, footage from that. Our next two segments, I'm going to warn you right now, because it is bona fide real combat footage. This is not Hollywood that there are going to be some gruesome scenes. So if you're of queasiness in your stomach, this might not be for you. Uh, if you are a combat veteran who gets triggered because uh, for PTSD with uh, just seeing scenes of combat, I'm warning you that this is not exact. I mean, it's not that bad, but at the same time, if uh, you have problems with seeing these kinds of things, you might want to turn off the TV or turn the channel for the next 15 minutes. If you do not, if, you, if this doesn't bother you, I really hope you keep watching uh, because this is really, this is the way it was and this happened 74 years ago. So we're going to actually take a look at the eyes of uh, Norman Hatch. Norman Hatch was a 22-year-old Marine Corps sergeant who was a combat cameraman and he had provided, he went out there with his camera 
uh, video camera and shot all of the um, uh, sequences that you see, or, or most of this. And his footage combined with a Navy videographer and I think another Marine Corps videographer actually made it into a documentary film put out by the De Defense Department. And that was really the first combat scenes that people here stateside had seen of the fighting going on in the Pacific since December 7th, 1941 and the attack on Pearl Harbor when those scenes first hit the movie tone newsreels uh, in front of the Saturday uh, TV, uh, Saturday film, uh, movie matinees. So here is Norm Hatch recalling the Battle of Tarawa. That is a picture of the photographers of the second marine division that landed on Tarawa. Me, I'm right here at the top. They're all gone. All gone. I have never forgotten the battle at Tarawa. The uh, Japanese lost over 4,000 people in that particular battle. We had about a little over 1,000 killed and uh, about 2,200 and some odd wounded in 76 hours. Nearly 70 years later, those memories remain fresh for 91-year-old Norman Hatch. When you get into the battle, the blood begins to race and you do your job. My job was to take pictures. I had to shoot the pictures the best way I could possibly shoot them. Hatch carried a hand-cranked 35-millimeter movie camera. He waded in right beside machine gunners going ashore. Looking through the viewfinder and trying to frame the story that I was shooting, it was like looking at a movie. And uh, in a sense, uh, I felt detached in a degree from what was happening around me. Even when he saw his comrades get shot and fall, Hatch continued to document the battle. The troops that were on the so-called front line would say when you'd come up, what are you doing here? You don't have to be here. And I would say, yes, I do, because the public has to know what we're doing. And this is the only way they're really going to know is by seeing this film through the newsreels. President Franklin Roosevelt had to grant special permission for the public release of Hatch's film, which included gruesome and disturbing images. Nobody really had seen a down and dirty fight. That's the best way to describe it. Tarawa was really the first film that the public saw of in close fighting, both our people and Japanese in the same frame of film. These are the Marines who took Tarawa. Hatch's footage is included in the documentary film with the Marines at Tarawa, which won an Academy Award in 1944. It is also featured in director Stephen C. Barber's new documentary, Until They Are Home. The film chronicles efforts to find the remains of fallen Marines and bring them home almost seven decades after the last shot was fired on the Pacific Island. After the war, so many people would say to me something about, uh, how come you walked all over the play battlefield and never got hit? I have no answer as to why I wasn't shot. You take chances and hopefully you win. That's the way it goes. For producer June So, Amy Katz, VOA News. And Norm Hatch is absolutely right because that was what the job that he did in World War II, similar to the job that I did when I was in Iraq in 2003 and 2004, except I was a still photographer and uh, public affairs correspondent, whereas Norm Hatch was a videographer. You walk around, you do your job. Uh, in my case, I interviewed a lot of people, wrote stories, and uh, on and off base, and it, it, it you see the war from a completely different viewpoint and you get a little bit lucky in the fact that when you can come home unscathed as far as physical wounds uh, you're you're lucky you know I still have a few physical wounds from mine I'm sure uh, I'm sure Norm Hatch had experienced something in his day but the fact is you know Hatch was able to live a long and fulfilled life after that so we're going to show you now uh, more extensive footage 
from uh, another documentary that was really done up right after, right after the uh, battle. I mean, Hatch was still in the Marine Corps at the time that this was done, where it was showing more of the scenes that he had shot, more than what you've just seen in that Voice of America segment. This is the Army-Navy Screen Magazine Cutting Room, where a combat film taken by Army, Navy, and Marine cameramen comes in from battlefronts all over the world. The Marine Staff Sergeant with the Expert Medal is 22-year-old Norman Hatch from Boston, Massachusetts. Sergeant Hatch went in with the first wave on the landing at Tarawa, armed with a pistol and a hand camera and brought back a film record of the fighting on that island that looks as though it had been taken through a front-line gun sight. Hey, let me see that sight. You know, that's the best frame of combat film I've ever seen. Hey, that's okay. When an army man says that to a Marine brother, he means it. Oh, it's just luck. You mean guts. Well, it didn't take any more guts than you fellows had when you went in on Kiska. Well, we had plenty of camera, plenty of film in Kiska, but we did apps. <laughs> <laughs> How many cameras did take in with you? Took in three IMO hand cameras. Food Lurko got his camera wet the first day. Yeah, that left us with two cameras, uh, Kelly's and mine. We took in about 5,000 feet of film, and I only shot at 2,000. Only 2,000? Well, that's all. I picked my shots. <laughs> <laughs> Did you shoot much film on the uh, ship? Well, I've got a cut reel over here. Do you want to see it? Yeah. yeah I uh, all I don't know is what I've seen the newsreel. We shot some stuff on the way over. And the Navy boys shot some stuff on the wagons. This is a shot of the task force underway. I was trying to save film, but it was my first big job, and there were a couple of pictures I had to take. On the last day out, Father Francis Kelly celebrated Mass. Twenty-four hours later, a lot of those fellows were dead. A Navy steward baked a cake, and the frosting had a big laugh. But the warning didn't seem so funny when we hit the beach on the next day. Every Marine in the outfit, including the cameraman, knew as much about the operation as his CO. We were going out to take Basio Island, key to an atoll called Tarawa, a move that would drive the Japs out of that part of the Pacific up into their bases in the Marshalls a couple of hundred miles north. D-Day was the 20th of November. The naval bombardment began at 0500. There weren't any Jap airplanes around, but there's a Jap sub out there that the boys kept on the move. One thing I didn't want to take a picture of was a Jap torpedo heading for my boat. Our Army and Navy planes had been pasting the island for five days, and it didn't seem as though anyone on base show could have lived through that bombing. And we weren't green. I've served with the Marines for five years, and more than half of the task force were veterans of Guadalcanal. But we figured there wouldn't be many live Japs left on the island. Navy men on the wagons took these pictures of the loading of powder charges. I was slated to go in with the first wave, and we were waiting around with the Amtraks. Everybody got a kick out of watching the wagons unload on the target. Twenty-eight hundred tons of bombs and shells hit the beaches and cut through the pounds like a whipsaw. We packed shovels along with us, but we figured we wouldn't have to dig any foxholes, only Jap graves. There was a heavy smoke coming off the island, carried along by an easterly breeze. The Japs were still answering our fire when we headed in. The water was choppy. These pictures of the first wave of Amtrak were taken about a thousand yards from shore. We were heading straight in for the bloodiest operation in the history of the Marine Corps, but we still thought it was going to be a picnic. There's a gasoline dump going up. The air support was good. 
we kept about 100 planes in the sky all the time, blasting and strafing the Japs along the beach. Then the Higgins boat snagged on a reef, and the Japs began to get our range and the range of the Amtraks. We had to get out and wade about 400 yards of terrific crossfire. The sniper was firing me when I got those shots. These shots were made a few minutes after the landing. And the guys were hugging the beach, trying to get their wind after the 400-yard push. It wasn't going to be any 24-hour operation. There were plenty of Japs on the island, and they decided to die there. The Japs had spent every day and night for 15 months getting the island ready for a fight. The top of that blockhouse was about 15 feet wide. Fire. The Japs kept coming out, trying to knock out the machine gun. There's one of them. That sniper's got a beat on another. There's a squad of them. Boy, it was hot that day and was I sweating. the truth, but it doesn't give you any idea of how it smells, and the smell on that island was bad. The wounded started going back six minutes after we hit the beach, and the stretcher bearers, all members of the shore party, were the unsung heroes of Tarawa. Plenty of them got hit. Stretcher bearers loaded the wounded onto rubber rafts and pushed them out to the Higgins boats off the reef. That was the only way of getting them out. They couldn't load them on at the pier because of the sniper. We lost more than 1,000 Marines. More than 2,000 of our men were wounded. I'd served with the outfit for 15 months, and I knew a lot of them. On the third day, that Marine, the one without the helmet, was souvenir hunting when he found a couple of Japs in that foxhole. The Japs lost 5,700 men, Imperial Japanese Marines, defending an island that wasn't two miles square. That gives you an idea of how important Tarawa was in their plans. It was the stiffest price they've ever paid and one of their greatest defeats. We call those two the brothers. We brought in a few Japanese prisoners for intelligence. No more than a couple of hundred. That sniper was nearly six feet tall. The prisoners had to be stripped to keep them from concealing weapons. And they'd hide a weapon anywhere. They were sullen and still hoped up over the idea that they were supermen, even after they'd been captured. The Koreans were different. They were men whose country had been captured by the Japanese. And the Japs brought them out to Tara to work as slaves. When we got back to Pearl Harbor, they told us that in Cairo, Roosevelt, Churchill, and Chiang Kai-shek had guaranteed Korea her independence on the same day that we saved these Koreans from the Japanese. I took these pictures the day before Thanksgiving.
The camera gives you a good idea of the kind of desolation the cracked brains in Berlin and Tokyo have wished on the world. The wreck jack equipment we found has been brought in from all over. China, Malaya, Burma, Manchuko. They had that two by four island loaded down with the loot from every country they've overrun. They even dragged guns down from the old British fortress at Singapore. But none of it was much good to them after the second day of fighting with the guns knocked out and the gunners dead. There's a kitten I found in the tracks of a Jap tank. The smell of water brought her out. That's me giving her the water. The other cameraman took the picture. The men got around to taking fresh water baths on the third day, and boy, they needed them. CBs were already working on the two bomber strips on the island. And on the fourth day, Tarawa began to function as an advanced air base. Ensign Bill Kelly of Newcastle, Pennsylvania, brought the first plane in. Everybody got around to watch the flag go up. A lot of good guys from the outfit weren't there anymore. I'm glad I got these pictures, because when you remember the roaches you've been fighting and the things they represented, and when you saw the flag go up and remembered the freedom that flag stood for, you knew you were in on a good thing. And that is why we stand for the national anthem. I actually have one more, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> one more story to tell you about the Battle of Tarawa. It involves a Minneapolis native named Eddie A. Heimberger. He was a Navy lieutenant, junior grade, uh, served on, uh, he was commander of salvage boat 13 from the USS Sheridan, uh, along with Lieutenant John Fletcher, who was the commander of the salvage boat 14. Uh, during the initial landing, they saw approximately 150 wounded Marines from the 1st Battalion, 8th Marine Regiment, who were stranded on the reef. I think this might have actually been the second day on uh, November 21st. Uh, acting independently, the lieutenants may, each made three to four trips to the reef, picked up Marines and brought them out to the larger landing craft mechanized LCM vehicles for transfer to hospital ships. Salvage boat 13 suffered a damaged propeller on the fourth trip, prompting Heimberger to return to the Sheridan. And there he com commandeered four empty Higgins boats, uh, which are much smaller troop transports, uh, and save for the boat crews, so they were empty, except for the boat crews, and they made one last rescue attempt as the tide was now rising, making life difficult for the wounded Marines. I'm gonna read out a, a, a section out of Heimberger's official report. Uh, quote, because of the lay of the coral and the position of the men in the water, the tide, and the hazards of the concentration of boats, this, uh, this officer decided that taking off the men with one boat at a time would be the best plan. Uh, the other boats were to lay a few hundred yards off and attempt to keep the machine gun nests quiet with their 30 calibers. Uh, he was personally responsible for rescuing 47 Marines supervised the rescue of 30 others, and received the Bronze Star with Combat V for his actions. He did survive the battle, and for some of you old-timers are familiar with, uh, actually familiar with who uh, Heimberger actually is, because he was better known by his stage name. Um, he acted on the television show Green Acres, and hosted a variety show, the Eddie Elbert Show. And he was nominated for an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor in the film The Heartbreak Kid. And so actor Eddie Arnold received the Bronze Star with Combat V for actions at Tarawa. Uh, but the Battle of Tarawa is really still not over. Uh, the casualties, as was discussed in the last, uh, last two sections, were horrific but there were also people who had died and never made it home. Now there were some who were uh, taken, off, taken away and unknown and buried at the Punch Bowl Cemetery in uh, Hawaii. Uh, unknown Tarawa is how their grave markers were listed. Others were buried on the island and or uh, just 
missing in action on the island and subsequently buried, uh, but nobody knows where they're at. Which brings me into the Joint POW-MIA Accounting Command, uh, formerly known as JPAC, J-P-A-C. And we're going to show you um, a highlight from a mission that they had on Tarawa in 2010. The mission's ongoing. They're still working on finding missing uh, Marines and sailors from Tarawa, even in 2017, and, then, and that'll be continuing in 2018. But here is uh, some highlights from their mission in 2010. This mission here on Tarawa is a total of 55 days. Presently, we've been on this site for three days. We are planning to finish this site today, and then we will move on to our, our second site. I just think that it's such a neat mission and such a rewarding and honorable thing to do for us to always look for our fallen brethren that, that never returned home. And the motto of you are never forgotten it, it is dead on because you aren't. You know, our government does not treat you just as a number. We will always look for you. When you when you hear about JPAC and you know, you know, know their mission, why wouldn't you want to come and help? You know, why wouldn't you want to come and help find some lost sailors, soldiers, Marines, airmen, and, and bring them home, give closure to the families? There's no, nothing greater feeling than that. For this particular mission, our team composition um, starts with a team leader which is myself, and we are in charge ultimately of command and control, logistics, and then overall safety um, for the team. You keep your eyes open, you're ever vigilant, the minute you see something, you stop. I don't mind walking back and forth here 110 times for a suspected pig bone or something else, but when you see something, you need to call me, all right? You also have the recovery leader, which is Dr. Fox. He is the overall scientific expert on site. And the second we step on the site, my main function, the whole team's function, is to support him in any way that we see fit. So they need to, they need to dump the wheelbarrows over there and then bring them back and get them loaded, not buckets. I want this stuff gone tonight to screen today. My job is to supervise or to oversee the scientific recovery of remains to decide how deep, how far, what to dig, where to dig, when to dig. It's just like a crime scene. And the evidence we're trying to collect is the remains of missing U.S. service members. The sewer line project in the late 1970s did find a couple of remains here, one of which was identified as U.S. Marine. So we're ever hopeful that there's some undisturbed ground in and around here. So we're, right now we're still digging discovery trenches. Grab a tape and uh, get that five uh, 502.5, 516 North Stake back in there. Measure two meters off of it. Toward that end of the trench, two meters that way. We're gonna put a two meter wide trench that way next. Doc Fox has an anthro. I can learn a lot from him. And I look at somebody and see what I can learn. If I can learn anything from him, I'm gonna to try to better my skills as a mortuary affairs specialist. My role with Dr. Fox is to basically be a second set of hands for him and kind of augment uh, him in the assistance of handling the human remains so that he can use his hands to hold the human remains at the utmost possible respect that he can. Hey, Aunt, what did you guys find? What did you find? It appears like we may have some possible human remains in the corner of this, but I can't tell anything until I dig that down that down and this down. So what we're doing now is we were digging a test trench. We were taking all of the uh, sediments out of the trench and stockpiling it. Now we're going to, uh, what we'd stockpiled from this corner, we're going to screen all that. And I'm going home to all this stuff screen tonight, so. Uh, 
So right now we're screening from the barrier that Dr. Fox is doing. So I'm screening this individually now, since the dirt that was around the barrier. So as the process starts, I mean, you get all your dirt up in there, you do a quick shake, you get all your loose dirt that falls through the screen. The first step, you just want to take anything out that you know that's not organic to down, like trees and stuff, you can throw that out. Metal pieces, you know that you can throw that out. Um, coral that you can identify with your eyes, you can throw that out. Anything you can't see, like as um, like right now, that's when you want to start screening. You don't want to press down hard on it, and you don't want to press down too light. So you want to just get that medium fill. You want to fill it and just rub it through the screen. And the reason you, find, you don't want to press too hard is because some of the bones are you know, very fragile. Correct. And they crack and... And then it can go right through yeah. the screen. Right. And you just keep going doing the process. Hoping to catch anything that may be anything that might be of those remains. Right here, I found too, but it's not human, but it's still a tooth, right. and we never know, so we still put it in the bucket. Right. So, so we can't make that call. Only the seal back in the white can make that right. call. So, okay. I mean, but they in fact, even from that small bone fragment that, that in Hawaii in the lab, they could do testing via DNA mm -hmm. to yeah. find out who this person is. Right. We actually found a, uh, uh, a piece of what could possibly be a uh, human bone right right about here, mm -hmm. right up against this wall. So, but it was just one small piece, you know, that's kind of running, you know, it's starting to run into where the sewer line is, so we're curious about that. You guys have been very busy, very impressive, a lot of digging. It's all about dirt management. <clears throat> dirt management is the key. Depending on how many remains we get here, we might call one of the anthropologists down for a field forensic review. It all depends on the condition of the remains, whether they're viable for DNA, whether we think they're viable for DNA, whether they have uh, dental remains with restorations, fillings, and bridges of how quickly it will be done. There's a lot of missing, so it will take a while to get family reference samples if we do have to go to DNA. We have most of the individual deceased personnel files already for everybody on Carl. The remains are where the water table is right now. Right. So pieces like the ribs, you know, the, the small thin bone, they become very fragile. Hey, lady, did yeah. you say that right arm, the left arm? Right arm, the left arm. Four. 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 Yeah. Let me uh, In put them all on their own. Sections for the set. Correct. Uh, they're labeled with the mission, the uh, site identifier. This is the grid coordinates. So this is from the burial, too. And then we identify which items they are. And that's how we can, one, keep, you know, each set of potential remains separate and make sure everything's accounted for. Right. So basically what I'm doing here is uh, taking some of the stuff out of the hole. You know, it's, it's really muddy. And uh, basically doing an improvised wet screening station here with the water that's already here from the water table. You're just looking for any, any more bone that we may be finding. And you can tell, you know, this is a lot easier than what I would be doing, just rubbing with my hand. Right. As you can Treat. tell, I mean, you can start seeing a lot more of the color of the coral, the wood. You know, and we're hoping we're going to find some bone in here. Different colors of the soil pops out to you, and you can really get a better look at it. I've already grabbed two bones out. Just for a quick look. And of course, it's all going to go back to the lab, analyze, hopefully get identified. One has to appreciate their sense of patience because this, the work that they do is, is nothing short of painstaking. These are highly fragmented remains. This is, this is not a, going to be a very short process. If there are more than one individual, they all have to be uncommingled, and that may take cutting lots and lots of skeletal elements for DNA. 
are the same remains we get to the laboratory. And then they can be sorted out on the table so that we maintain integrity through the entire process going toward the identification so we can get any missing U.S. service members who may or may not be represented by these skeletal elements home to their families as soon as possible. And that is a good look at what happens when you have recovery teams trying to repatriate U.S. service members who are missing in action. You know, the silt that has built up over the last seven and a half decades, plus some who were buried in trenches or, or whatnot, makes locating them difficult. But we still send teams out to recover American service personnel. And, it's, and I'm highlighting the Battle of Tarawa and the Marine Corps in this particular instance, but they've, rec they've um, and we've covered this uh, extensively in the last couple of years, the USS Oklahoma from Pearl Harbor. Uh, there were unknown service members from that uh, vessel who were um, who've been um, undergoing forensic analysis, and we've actually covered a couple of uh, funerals of those who were repatriated. And I know the same thing happens in the European theater, uh, with, and you know, with the army. I uh, hear of. Um, of uh, Air Force, or Army Air Corps pilots who are, are being repatriated, who uh, they're, they're taking this stuff very, very seriously. And I'm really, really thankful for that. Um, as I mentioned prior to that last segment, that this is an ongoing thing. So even though that video is from 2010, there are still recovery teams in uh, Tarawa as of today. Uh, there's an organization that I highly recommend you take a good look at. It's called History Flight. They're a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to finding and recovering America's missing. They have done an excellent job of pooling the resources, hiring the experts, and trying to take a little bit of the re responsibility on themselves to assist the uh, Defense POW MIA accounting agency in their efforts. I mean, more resources you can throw at a problem, the quicker it is to solve. And History Flight has been doing a fantastic job with the recovery efforts in Tarawa and some other locations. And in February, early, earlier this year, February 10th, uh, they had a repatriation ceremony for missing Marines or missing service members from Tarawa. And we're going to show you a quick clip of that right now. We left Hawaii um, about 1,100 hours two days ago. We arrived here about 1,300 in the afternoon. Um, a couple of us set up our rooms and settled down a little bit, and then we were able to go out and explore. Uh, we actually went to Red Beach 1 and Red Beach 2, where the Marines and the sailors actually made the first landing on Taro Atoll. Um, so we were able to actually see really a monumental piece of the Pacific campaign. So that was really great for us. As a Marine, it's, it's particularly important to me. This is a really monumental battle that was fought during the Pacific campaign of World War II. And for me individually, I served the first five years of my, camp, my career with the 2nd Marine Division. So there's a lot of history and heritage that was really imbued upon me in my first five years. So it's particularly important to be in here. And then uh, we were able to walk through the city as well. We had a couple guys with us. Um, we made our way over to the Pacific Memorial for the Marines and for the sailors that battled and lost on Tarawa. Um, we were able to pay our respects to the Marines who gave their lives and the sailors who gave their lives here as well during the campaign, uh, during the World War II Pacific campaign. And it was really a great opportunity and we got to actually do a little groundskeeping. We were able to clean up the area and really that was, that was our way to pay our respect more than just being here and paying reverence. So we're here today and, uh, and yesterday to repatriate the remains of, of a few service members that were lost during the campaign. We're going to transfer them now from Tarawa and we're going to bring them back and give them a dignified burial or they're going to be returned to their families and give them some peace and semblance. One of the Marines 
Not, uh, okay, let me rephrase here. I don't know if those remains have been identified yet. I have not really taken a look to see if anybody from February has been identified. But I'm going to tell you about Marine Corps Corporal Anthony Guerrero. He was 22 years old from Boston, Massachusetts, assigned to Company B, 1st Battalion, 2nd Marines of the 2nd Marine Division. Uh, and they landed against stiff Japanese resistance on Beishu Island. And uh, Guerrero died on the second day of battle, November 21st, 1943. In the immediate aftermath of the fighting on Tarawa, U.S. service members who died in the battle were buried in a number of battlefield cemeteries on the island. The 604th Quartermaster Graves Registration Company conducted remains recovery operations on the island between 1946 and 1947, but Guerrero's remains were not identified. All of the remains found on Tarawa were sent to the Schofield Barracks Central Identification Laborator Laboratory for identification in 1947, and by 1949, the remains that had not been identified were interned in, interred in the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific, better known as the Punch Bowl in Honolulu. In October 2016, a little over a year ago, the Defense POWMIA Accounting Agency disinterred Tarawa Unknown X-049 from the punch bowl and sent the remains to laboratory for analysis. To identify Guerrero's remains, scientists from DPAA and the Armed Forces Medical Examiner System used mitochondrial DNA analysis, which matched his family, dental and anthropological analysis, which matched his records as well as some circumstantial evidence. And the Department of Veterans Affairs and History Fly, or actually Department of Ver Veterans Affairs um, was a partner in this particular mission, mainly for the disinterment. And on uh, November 14th, two weeks ago, Corporal Anthony Guerrero was laid to rest at Arlington National Cemetery. And we're going to show you some video from his funeral. Today we are repatriating uh, Marines that have recently been recovered in Tarawa. And we are uh, bringing them back home to Honolulu um, in order to do DNA analysis and uh, make identifications and therefore account for those Marines. As a Marine, I couldn't ask to, uh, you know, do something more impactful or more meaningful. Um, to come here 70 plus years later and, and be able to bring a fellow Marine home from a, a conflict where, you know, they were essentially, you know, unaccounted for um, and, and be able to bring closure to a family even if it's years later, it's extremely meaningful and, and humbling. Sorry about that. Uh, there was a clip in there of the actual repatriation uh, ceremony transfer remains that I was not aware that I still had in the list. So uh, that was what happened there. This was the actual flight and receiving the remains in the United States. So now we are going to go to Corporal Guerrero's funeral at Arlington National Cemetery. That's the one.
So why do we stand for the national anthem? I hope today you understand that it requires a lot of sacrifice. A lot of sacrifice to keep us free. Free from invasion from foreign countries. Regardless of what you think politically in the modern era, Republican, Democrat, pro-Trump, against Trump, doesn't matter. What matters is the fact that a lot of blood has been shed on behalf of this country. The veterans are buried in cemeteries all across this great land. And it's their sacrifice that we remember when we stand up and present our honors to the United States of America and its flag. And with that, I hope you will please join me in standing for our national anthem. <laughs>